Holy Spirit, we thank you for you, God, for you being that timeless God. You being a God that transcends generation to generation, God, and today our world finds itself in a crazy place. These United States find themselves, finds itself in a crazy place. And the church of God, the people of God, finds themselves in a challenging place this morning. But we know you're the God that has dominion and power. You're the God that transcends time from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. So Holy Spirit, as I stand to speak this morning, just give me a level of boldness, God, just to say what you've dropped in my spirit, to encourage the body of believers, to encourage the saints, to encourage the church of God to move forth, God. So we pray that as your word goes forth, that Holy Spirit, you would have your way, God. And even as we come back on the end to celebrate the Lord's table and we worship you tonight, I am praying this morning, I am praying that your spirit would just move freely in this place. Oh, how we love you and oh, how we give you praise. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. What an awesome and a mighty God we serve. Amen. I, I tell you what, I'm, I, I'm hoping that wherever you find yourself, that you feel the presence of God like we feel it in this place. Um, the day is going to come when the church will be able to come back together. But I tell you for right now, I'm trusting that you're having the experience that we're having here because God is truly moving and God is truly saying and doing some awesome things in our midst. As we prepare to go into the Word this morning, I'm sure by now that you've already heard, um, it was, I think, believe a couple of weeks ago that our president made the declaration that houses of worship, is what he says, have been de deemed essential businesses. And our president has ordered local governors uh, to reopen churches effective immediately. And that was an edict that he issued a couple of weeks ago. I want you to hear me say that the safety of every member, attender, and friend of Restoration Christian Fellowship is the primary concern and your safety is, is very, very important to us. What that means to me is that Restoration Christian Fellowship as a ministry, though we do plan to reopen our doors, we are under no pressure, nor we are any hurry, until we, for in the meantime, we plan on continue to stream our worship experiences on Sunday and Wednesday. And our goal, before we even open publicly, is to have a solid re-entry plan that guarantees the safety of every person who enters our doors. I want you to hear me say that. Your safety, your health is, is a primary concern to this ministry. So we're not going to violate anything to try to get you to come back and end up being more sick and be a part of what's going on. Now, listen to this because this is the twist I want to take today. My theology does not allow for me to believe that any government can close the church. Now, if, if, if your belief systems allow room for churches to be closed, then your definition of the church might be different from that of the Bible. Hear, hear me say this. According to the biblical definition, the church is defined as the ecclesia. That means the called out body of believers. The church is not a building which can be closed or open. Come on, say amen wherever you find yourself. But the church itself is a body of believers that are called together who have Jesus on the inside. I'm going to say it again. The church is not a building. Come on, it's not, it's not a building. It's the people. It's, it's, it's the, the, the saints that are called to be who God would have us to be. So the church being a people and not a building is the driving force that caused the early believers in the New Testament to meet as small groups in their homes because they realized they did not have a building to come together and worship in, so they met in small groups and they worship in their homes. The church being a people and not a building is what caused the underground church in China and other third world countries to continue to meet even when governments and, 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 and leaders in that day and age made it illegal for people to come together and gather. 
The church being a people and not a building is what prompts come along, many church planters to focus on what was known or what is known as house churches. You see, the problem is we have become so secluded in our living place that we don't want people to come there. And we don't realize when we do that, we're really restricting the church. The church being a people and not a building is the driving force behind the success of small groups that have made large ch larger churches so successful. And I want us to get this in our spirit this morning. The church is not a building. The church is a people. Come on, I wish you would just repeat that. Say, the church is not a building. Come on, the church is a people. The biblical truth that supports the premise that the church is a people, not a building, is founded in Peter's declaration that Jesus was the Messiah that was sent by God to redeem his people back to a relationship with him. Matter of fact, when Jesus heard Peter say that, he said to Peter in so many words, Peter, you realize that the church is not the synagogue, the church is not a building, the church is a people. And upon the revelation that I am the Messiah, the Son of God, here's what Jesus said to Peter. He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock, he says, I will build my church, and guess what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm going to come to that. So the sad commentary today is people have so forgotten that the church is not a building but a people, they are saddened because they do not know how to have church without a building. Lord Jesus, let me say it again. And as we pass through and endure this current pandemic that we find ourselves going through today, I believe God is calling for something different. I really believe that call, God is calling for a different way to do church. I believe God is expecting that his church, that his people, the ecclesia, the called out people of God, be mobilized in a different way, in ways that we have never dreamt of, in ways that we have never seen before, in ways that we have never thought of. God is calling for us to be different. And if we are not sensitive to the word of God, and the move of God, we miss what God is doing in the church in this moment in history. So I need, as we go into this word today, for you to begin the process of switching your mindset that the church is not a building that you can open and close. I, gotta, I know I sound like a broken record. The church is a people. And, and, and we forget that. And because we forget that, we miss the buildings. Amen. But we've got to get to the place where we lock into what God is doing. Today, I want to look at a passage of Scripture, and the text that we're going to look at today, uh, it presents us with principles that I'm going to say that's going to challenge us to rethink church. It's going to challenge us to do things a little differently. The text itself, um, there's not so much direct correlations to the text from what we're going through today, but I believe that there's principles that we can extract because God spoke to me prophetically through that text, and it's through the prophetic voice of God that I want to stand before you and share what God is saying. So when you look at the text, if you were to go to me to the book of Acts chapter 27, we're going to talk through this. I want to narrate portions of it, then I'm just going to read a small portion of it, and we're going to talk through four simple principles that I want to extract, and then we're going to go in our communion service and just continue to worship God this morning that the Lord would have his way. In, in the text in Acts chapter 27, here's what you see in Acts chapter 27. Paul, the apostle, finds himself imprisoned for his commitment to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Jews had, him, had Paul imprisoned, and they wanted to kill him uh, because they believed he was going against their cultural norms, and he was preaching a false doctrine. They mistakenly believed that Paul was going against everything of the Old Testament law and talking about not being circumcised no more, not obeying the law. They mistakenly believed that Paul was contradicting everything the fathers had taught them. 
But what they did not know about the Apostle Paul was that he had a conversion experience. And in his conversion experience, he was really teaching that Christ didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. And there was a new way of doing things, but because they were so caught up in the traditional norms of how the, the commonplace of the way things were and the way things should be, they missed the essence of what Paul was teaching and what Paul was saying. So today's text now, here's what it does. It details that they've got Paul in prison, and Paul has rights, and Paul decides to exercise his rights as opposed to going to trial from the Jerusalem council. He exercises his right as a Roman citizen to go to Rome to be tried before Caesar so Caesar could hear his case. So back then, they didn't have planes like we do now where you can shackle a prisoner and put him on the plane and send him to Rome. Their, their only means of travel was by sea on boat. So when you look at the text today, the text details Paul's journey from um, all the way to Rome. And as they're on their way to Rome, he encounters what I'm going to refer to as a hurricane force type storm that resulted in major damage to the ship that they were traveling in. It, it risked the lives of the entire crew of 276 people that were on board the ship. Now, hear me say this because I know you're going to have your critiques and, and, and your people out there that's going to say, well, he didn't say nothing about the text. Listen to me carefully. Today's message is not for me to exegete this storm that Paul encountered on the sea because I don't want you to focus so much on the storm and focus so much on the ship and focus so much on the, rick, the, the shipwreck that they had. My goal today is to look at this text and I want to share with you what God shared with me by way of parallelism that will help us to survive life's storms today. The importance that of the things that I want to share with you today is to be able to stay with the ship and to be able to understand the new norms and what it really means to make it on broken pieces. So don't be so critical and, and be so locked into the text. We are going to read portions of it, but my job today is simply to extract some principles and share them with you to help us to make it today. So now... This narrative, this narrative, and open your Bibles, it begins in chapter 27, and, and where Paul and the accompanying prison, now understand, they had, locked, had him locked up, they were about to ship him off to Rome to be tried by Caesar, so now they're going to put Paul on board the ship with a whole lot of prisoners that are shackled together, and then they assigned this centurion by the name of Julius to accompany them as they make it to their journey aboard this cargo ship. Now, lock into this. The journey itself, it has many stops because it's not like you can get on a plane and within three hours or 12 hours or X number of hours you're on your journey. Mind you, this journey took many days. It took many days for them to get from where they were to where they were going in Rome. And of interest to this, today's discussion is not so much the trip in its entirety. I want to focus solely on what happens in verse 13 all the way down to verse 44 so we can talk about it. So now, let's go to work. So as the journey begins, Paul now and the team is on board the ship. And everything at the start of the journey looks well. It started off where there was a gentle south wind gracing the sails of the ship, and then they're making their journey. But then all of a sudden, and you've heard me say this before as we've been talking about surviving life storm, out of nowhere, this storm with hurricane force winds comes and it drops itself on the ship of 276 people where out of nowhere, in, the, in an instant, they found themselves in a terrible storm where their lives were in danger and everybody on board the ship 
was in danger. And, and, and matter of fact, this storm was so bad, you've got to hear me say this, nobody expected to survive the storm because it was so bad. But does anybody out there know when God has a word over your life and when God releases a word in your life, no demon in hell, come on, you got to hear me, no storm, nothing can disrupt you. I wish I had a praying church can stop you from doing what God said he's going to do. Do you hear me this morning? So as you look at the text, there's four simple principles that I want to share. And so let me read, let me read. Look with me at verse 21. I want to read verse 21 through 26, and I'm going to share these things. Verse 21 says, and I'm jumping right in the middle. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and have not set sail from Crete and incurred um, this injury and loss. Look at verse 22. Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be, watch this, no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night stood before, there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that I, it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. I like this because to me, there's a prophetic word that's hidden in these words that's relevant to what the church finds itself going through. Now, here's the first thing I want to share with you today. I want you to hear me say this. The first thing I want to share is this, is that the gates of hell cannot prevail against God's church. I, I got to say that again because somebody don't, they don't really get this. The gates of hell cannot prevail against God's church. Now, you might be saying, preacher, where in the world do you see that in the text? If you were to look at verse 22, here's what the word, the prophetic word came to Paul as Paul was spending his time seeking the Lord. He says this, Paul, take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but watch this, except for the ship. I want you to, to flesh that out a little while. There will be no loss of life among you except for the fish. Now, let me help you with the, the, the ship. Let me help you with this because here's the deal. The ship then was the vehicle that was responsible to carry the passengers to Rome. And here's what God is saying. The vehicle may be destroyed, but the passengers, I wish I had somebody in here, will be saved. And, and, and you've got to get this because you've got folk that, that don't know what to do right now because the vehicle has been impacted. I wish I had a praying church. I'm trying not to get too excited today. And what God has come to say, what God wants me to say to you, the doors of the church or the building may be closed, but the church is not a building. It's about the people. You can shut them, you can open them, but you cannot impact the people of God. My goodness, you got to say this. And I said this earlier again. If you were to look at Matthew 16, right, here's what it says. Peter, it says, upon this rock, upon the faith that you exemplify in me, upon the acknowledgement that I am the Messiah, I will build my church. And watch this. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. I had a smile on my face when President Trump got on the screen and said, I, I declare that churches are essential business. I smiled because I said, you, you must not be a part of the church because as far as I'm concerned, God's church has always been essential business and it's not restricted or relegated to any building. You've got to get this. You can burn churches down, but people can still worship. You can close churches up. Come on, y'all. But people can still worship. You've got to hear me say this. The gates of hell. So pastor, so leader, so church member, if you're out there freaking out on what I'm going to do, you might want to reevaluate how you're defining church. And in this season, I'm telling you, God is saying prophetically, there's got to be 
a different way to do it. And here's what you got to understand. The storm that, that Paul encountered at sea, this hurricane force type storm, could be symbolic of the storm that the nation finds itself in. This pandemic that has us not meeting. And here's what the word of the Lord is for the church of God today. The buildings may be closed. The buildings may be locked up. The buildings itself. But that does not impede or prevent my worship. So hear me say it again. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God. Look at the second thing that I see in this text. Look at the second things. And it's found in verse 23 and 24. Right? Here's what it says. For this very night, there stood before me an angel of the Lord to whom I belong. I hope there's a few people that's listening to me that belong to God. Come on. Whom I worship. Come on. And he said to me, do not be afraid. And watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Paul, you must stand before Caesar. I'm going to say it again. Paul, you must stand before Caesar. Now, now, I don't know if you get this. I don't know if you get this. But if I'm Paul and I'm on board a ship and I hear that God shows up to me and I know we're going to encounter a storm. I know that the ship is going to go through shipwreck. I know that the loss of cargo is going to exist and the loss of life could potentially exist. And, and, and then I'm stepping onto this thing. But the word of the Lord over my life is that you must stand before Caesar. Here's what that says to me. I don't know about any of y'all. I don't know about what you're going through. But if God releases a word over my life, God's word will stand true. So here's the second thing. God's church, hear me, will be preserved until the gospel is proclaimed throughout the earth. Why are you saying that, preacher? Because if God says something, it's going to happen. God's word, come on, I wish I had somebody in here, must be fulfilled. Look at what Scripture says in Isaiah. Go look at Isaiah chapter 55, right? Here's what it says. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but waters the earth, making it bring forth, what's, and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. I love verses 11. So shall be my word that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty, but it shall accomplish that which and the purpose for which I sent it out. So here's what Paul had. God said, Paul, you're going to go to Rome. So guess what? Paul had the assurance that no demon in hell could touch him. He had the assurance that no storm could kill him. He had the assurance that there's nothing anybody could do to him to stop the word of God. And you've got to hear this. This is why I'm saying the church is a people, not a building. If you think the church is a building, you can stop the church. But if you know it's a people and God releases a word, there is nothing you can do to stop the people of God. Why? Because God's word will not return to him void. Matter of fact, there's an encouraging word for somebody out there. If God has released a word over your life, hear me say this. No demon can stop you. Because that word cannot go back to God and say, God, I don't know what happened, but Ken died before it happened. No, no, no. God's going to say, but no, you got to resurrect him because my word must be released. you got to hear me say it. God's word cannot return in void. And if God said to Paul, you will stand before Caesar because he wanted the gospel preached in Rome, guess what? Nothing on that ship could prevent Paul from getting to Rome. Where am I going with this? Nothing can stop God's church from proclaiming the gospel. Nothing can stop God's church this is the importance of the church being a people from saying, thus saith the Lord. Right? Here's what Matthew 24 and 14 says. Right? Look at it. Here's what it says. As the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to the, all the nations. And watch this. And then, and then the end will come. So here's what that means. The world can't end until everyone hears the gospel. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. You, that, that's good news, church, because what it says the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of God. And God's word will 
go forward. Here's the third thing. Let me, let me hurry on. Here's the third thing I want you to share. Jump all the way down to verse 31. Let me read verse 31 down and give you some context and we'll talk about this, right? It says, this, Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, they cannot be saved. Okay? Now, here's this. Listen to, listen to number three. The church of God is not expected to abandon its mission, but it is challenged to discover innovative, that means new ways to serve the people and to advance the gospel. You got to find new ways. Now, now this is my parenthetic, okay? And, and, and you guys can't understand this. You got to be here. What excites me about coming here on Sunday morning and preaching to pews is I watch a worship team prepare for worship, and I watch them go into worship as if there's thousands of people in front of them, right? So, so here, here's what that means. Here's what that means. You being here or not does not impede their worship. I wish I had somebody in here because they're finding new ways to worship God. I watch the band play rhythmically like they're playing in front of Winter Park. I watch, I watch people just having a, because their worship is genuine and it's authentic and they've discovered new ways to worship God. Here's what's happening in the text. This storm got so bad. This pandemic lasted so long. Let me go here, okay? The civil unrest in the community was so tumultuous that people on board the ship said, forget this. And they wanted to jump overboard and take their own lives. I'm saying this to encourage somebody. I'm saying this to encourage some leader. What it looks like right now doesn't mean that you should stop and give up on what God has called you to do. You've got to find new ways. You've got to find different ways. You've got to find exciting ways to do what God has called you to do. Because you, you've got to hear me. You see, the way we did it yesterday might not be the way God wants it done tomorrow. And sometimes God, out of his own sovereignty, will disrupt things to press us to do things completely differently. And if we're stuck on how it was yesterday, we potentially will miss what God wants to do today, tomorrow, and in subsequent ways. So hear me again. The church is not called to abandon its mission but it is challenged to discover innovative ways to serve people and advance the gospel. Again, I'm sitting there and I'm watching the pre-service and I see a young lady on the screen by the name of Jamise. And you all don't know Jamise. Jamise would come to Restoration Christian Fellowship every Sunday and we couldn't pay Jamise to join the Ursher board. Amen. We, we couldn't pay Jamise to do anything, but all of a sudden, she doesn't have a problem standing in front of a camera. You see? New ways to engage people, new ways to mobilize people, new ways to do what God has called us to do, and the church must take advantage of this. Here's what Scripture says in Isaiah chapter 43, right? Look at this Scripture. Here's what God says. Behold, I am doing what? A new thing, he says. Now it springs forth, and do you not see it or perceive it? Watch what he says. I will make a way in the wilderness... And rivers where in dry places or in the desert. People of God, hear me. I'm going to sound like a broken record. The church is not a building. The church is a people. And God is calling his people to work differently in this season. He's calling them to be different. He's calling them to be a little more innovative and to do what God has called him to do. Here's the last thing I want to share with you, and then I'll be done, okay? Now, here's the fourth thing, and it's, it's found in verses 43 through 44. Let me read this, and we'll talk about this, okay? It says here, but the centurion wishing to save Paul kept them from carrying out their plan. I'll talk about this. Don't worry about this. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first. And to make it for land. And the rest, it says, on plank and on pieces of the ship, so that, it, so that it was that all were brought safely to the land. Now, here, let me say this and then I'll explain. Here's the fourth thing. God expects the entire church to be mobilized to reach the unsaved. Let me help you all with this. I'm saying it again. I'm saying it because I'm, I'm done here. God expects the entire church to be mobilized to reach the unsaved. Here's what's happening contextually in the text. 
Paul and them had been in this storm for well over 14 days. Imagine being at sea for 14 days, more than 14 days in a storm. Talk about seasick. Talk about throwing all your food overboard to try to make it. Talk about trying to survive the storm. And then in the middle of this 14-plus day storm, one day they see a break in the clouds and they saw what seemed to be in the distance land. So they made the decision, we're going to try to make the trek to make it to the land. And as they're trying to make it to the land, the front of the boat, the bow of the boat hits a reef and it gets stuck in a sand bed, and the front of the boat now is stuck on the ship, stuck on the sand bed, and the back or the stern of the boat is caught out in the waves, and there is nothing they can do to move this thing. So watch what happens. The wave comes, and it beats the back of the boat so bad that it literally destroys the ship. It destroys the ship. And so the captain says, this is to me now, those of you who can swim, Head for land. Those of you who can't swim, grab you a piece of the boat. Come on. And float on that thing to make it to the shore. And the Bible says that they all listened to the captain and they made it. Where am I going with this? I'm going with this. There's times when the church of God will present itself unmovable. In other words, it gets stuck in a sand dune and there is nothing that can happen to cause the thing to move. And sometimes God will send a storm to break up that which will not move to force it to move. And I'm crazy enough to believe that in this season, God could very well be breaking up buildings because folk thought it was all about the buildings. And here's what he says. I want to get you outside now, the buildings. I want to get you outside the buildings. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at the church, I see the church being broken. Come on. I, I don't know if you realize that because the church has been broken when it comes to the response of the abuse that we see by law enforcement. Right? The church is broken when it comes to the response of how we address, address issues of social injustice. The church is broken. Come on. When it looks at how we minister to people in the community, the church is broken. When it comes to the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning, the church is broken because we all go to our very core corners, and we don't know how to come together across denominational, cultural, and ethnic lines to worship God. The church is broken, so there comes a place where God's going to mobilize the church to make it unbroken pieces. And watch this. Those who can swim, get off. Swim for it. And, 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 and hear me. I think in this season, the church has been filled with people who can swim but they were comfortable coming to church Sunday morning after Sunday morning in the building not doing nothing. And now God is saying, get out the ship. Swim to shore. In other words, use your gift. Use your ministry. Mobilize the church. Get you a house church. Get 10 or 12 people that's not going anywhere, that's not watching online, that thought that the church is closed because the doors are closed, and, and help them to get to safety. Hear me. You got elders that's been called to preach that hadn't preached the word since they were called to preach. You've got deacons, you've got ministers, you've got strong people in the church that were complacent being strong. And now God has broken it up and he's saying, get out, get off, swim to shore. And then watch this. And for the babes in Christ, hang on to something. So for those of us who are strong, here's how scripture says it. We ought to bear the infirmity of the weak. But here's what we did. We would come to the building, get our front row seat, and talk about who are not where we are. And God is saying it is time to do something different. So hear me, hear me. I want you all to hear me say this. God's church is not closed. It's been open for business since God gave his life on Calvary. And we, the people of God, in this storm, the way we survive the storm is by mobilizing the church and doing what God has called us to do. Pastor Katani, come, worship team, come. Here's what I want to say as they're making their way to this platform as we transition to communion service. Restoration Christian Fellowship, we, we have plans to reopen, but we're not in a hurry. 
And we're probably going to do this in a multi-phased approach. Just hear me say this. Phase one might be us doing like a drive-by church in the parking lot where we might just have a big stage and let people come and greet each other, celebrate each other. Phase two may be where we open up this experience to probably no more than 50. The states are dictating how that ought to be done and we can have screening process, all that good stuff. And then in time, as the new norm is defined, we figure out what larger numbers look like. But like I said before, we're not in a hurry to put people at risk. Your safety is more important to us. But we got to redefine church. We've got to redefine how we do things. God wants to mobilize the church. But I heard, hope you heard me say this morning that God's church is not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. 